ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. I'm glad to have you guys here on this Friday night. It's a windy, blustery night. I thought my power was going to go out, but it hasn't went out yet. Fingers crossed it won't go out. <laughs> anyway, well, we're having a nice storm here. And the wind is blowing. And I think what saved the power was just before the wind started to blow, the temperature went up from 32 degrees Fahrenheit to about 36 degrees Fahrenheit. And what it did was it melted the ice off of some of the trees and stuff. You know, have you ever had a popsicle in the summertime and it's too cold to put your tongue on? And you can hold it out the window for just a couple seconds. It only takes two or three seconds. It'll soften your popsicle up. Wind is the awful effect of melting ice, especially if it's above freezing. So this little bit of a warmer wind came in, and it kind of melted the ice off the trees and reduced the weight that was on the trees somewhat, so that when the real heavier winds hit, well, the trees didn't break and put the power out. So it was fortunate. Anyway, let's get into this, and let's. I found a very interesting page. We're going to go over it with a fine-tooth comb. And it kind of shows your risk in your country. That's what the page shows. How much risk is in your country of this virus coming into your country? And we're going to go over that for a minute or two. You know, there's been quite a few new virus cases, most of them in Southeast Asia and in around Wuhan and in those areas in China, you know. But we got some good news too, guys. The numbers. In the United States and Canada, which is where most of my audience live, lives, they're not going up significantly. They're not really going up much at all. The numbers are stabilizing. And, I mean, that's really good news. It means that the virus is not really spreading too much in North America, you know. But I think it's going to require a lot of vigilance to keep this out. And, in fact, later... Maybe a few weeks from now, there might be a second wave coming in of infected individuals. And we need to keep vigilant, very vigilant, to try to keep this out. Anyway, let's move on to this page. Let's get the charts open right here and take a look. This page uh, is the novel coronavirus global assessment page. You know, it, uh, and that's what it's all about right here. And we're going to focus on some of their charts uh, let me see down here. I think it said uh, what, uh, just a sec. We're going to go down here. Reference and resources. John Hopkins, John, the, John Hopkins is a re reference. The, the World Health Organization is also a reference uh, here on this page. And let's get going on it. And let's take a look at some of these charts here and stuff. First chart I want to focus on. Let me see if I can get it in a little bit bigger for you guys. So you can see it a little bit better. Oh, my mouse isn't working that great. There we go. Okay, now let's increase the size so you guys can see it a little bit better. Zoom in a little bit. Okay, there. That's a little bit better. So we can see. Now this is the global risk assessment for each particular country. And we can see that Thailand, this is like, I'll tell you what this is. This is like, they weigh how much traffic is coming into your country, like on airplanes and stuff like that, and on trains and on buses and on uh, from the airport, mostly from the airports and also on ships and stuff like that. And they rate your assessment for how likely you are to, to actually have the virus be imported into your country in percentages. And so Thailand leads the list. It's the most dangerous for the virus to make its way into Thailand. Uh, at 2.179, Japan is second at 1.71. So Japan is, is going to have a lot of people coming into the country that could possibly have the virus. And we've already seen that. It's very true. So this is right on chart. South Korea is number three at 1.10%. Uh, South Korea and so it's that's another country where the virus is going to be threatening to come into their borders on airplanes on boats right and, and in many ways any way that air the virus can travel it has to travel it has to be 
the virus needs locomotion. It needs to have people being transported from one area to another. If people don't move, then the virus doesn't move. And so this is a list of how much movement comes into your particular country. We see Taiwan is number five on the list with 0.92%. Now, the USA is quite high. It's at 0.787%. That's the amount of movement of air traffic boats, how much is going to come into the country. But there is a factor to consider here. The USA is being very vigilant about tracking down individuals who might have this disease and also they're being very vigilant now. I mean, when it first started, it took them by surprise because they were looking for temperature. You know, does a person have a temperature? And that doesn't always hold true with this particular virus. And they've learned now that there's more to it than that. They're being very vigilant about this, the United States. But the United States is going to have a problem with people coming in with the virus because it's quite high on the list here at 7.87%. Vietnam is just beneath the United States at 0.75%. Then Malaysia. Then Singapore is, is on the list. Then Cambodia. Then Australia. And we've seen a lot of cases in Australia, you know. and We can see that they're quite high on the list. Indonesia is next, then Macau, then the Philippines, and we've seen cases in the Philippines. I think the first person to actually die from the virus outside of China was in the Philippines. Russia is next on the list, then Canada. So we're quite far up. We're in the middle there, here in Canada. India's next to us, just beneath us, then Germany. Well, we don't want it getting on the loose in India. Believe me, we do not want this virus in India because there's a very dense population in India, and India has an awful lot of people there. We don't want this virus going anywhere near India. We don't want it going near anywhere, anywhere in the world, but India is one place we do not want this virus going. And, but they've had three cases in there so far. Then Germany, then the Arab Emirates, then Myanmar, then the United Kingdom. Now, I know a lot of my listeners are in the United Kingdom, so the United Kingdom is ranked quite low on the list, actually, here. Uh, but they've had two cases. Then Italy, then France, then Qatar, then New Zealand, Netherlands, Turkey, Laos, Spain, and Ethiopia. That's, that's how it goes down the list there. So now, what have we down here? We go down a little bit further. Uh, I'm going to shrink the page size down a little bit again. There we go, so you guys can see it better. It says, what is the relative import risk? By looking at air travel passengers' numbers, we can estimate how likely it is that the virus spreads to other areas. The busier flight routes, the more probable it is that an infected passenger travels on these routes. Using these parabolic concepts, we calculate the relative import risk to other airports. When calculating the import risk, we also take into account the connecting flights and travel routes that involve multiple destinations. Problematic con con concepts such as import probability invasion rate, and both relative and absolute import risk are frequently misinterpreted and mistaken for each other. Therefore, in order to understand the data presented at this site, it is necessary to understand a distinction between these concepts. The relative import risk is defined in the following way. If an infected individual boards a plane at an airport, airport A, an affected region, in an, in an affected region like, like Wuhan, the relative import risk at airport B qual qualifies the probability that airport B is the final destination for that individual, irrespective of non-direct transit routes. Uh, so they're showing how they, how they figure these things, you know. 
and how they come up with those numbers that I just showed you there. Uh, it's quite complicated to tell you the truth, but they're really working on this. You can see some of their spread charts here. Uh, this is an interactive visualization of the most probable, probable routes and affected distances is offered in the route analysis effective distance selection. So this is one of their, their charts right here. Let me focus in on it so you guys can see it a little bit better. Oop. Give me a second here. <laughs> I might have got it too big. Try that again. <laughs> anyway, let me let me bring the chart in this way, and you guys can maybe you can see it a little bit better. So, so what we can see is is they're using computer modeling and everything else to try to figure out exactly what countries are in the most danger and everything. But at the same time, as this virus is on the move. They're going to have to run these computations again if the virus starts to move into other countries. Uh, uh, I can see that happening. Uh, so anyway, what we're looking at here, the, the real, the real nitty-gritty of it all is the situation that the countries are in and where they're on this, this particular list uh, of how much danger it's going to be for, for new passengers to actually come in to your country from other countries and in fact the probability this is the probability list of, of 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 the risk assessment it says global risk assessment results in a nutshell right here so this is a really good chart I really enjoyed seeing this because it gives you an idea where your country in particular stands at risk of people coming into your country from other countries that have the are importing the disease of course you know they're going to have to run these charts every couple of days every three or four days at least because it's going to change as there's more people infected these charts will change as time goes by if if other countries start to get more cases of the virus you know it's going to change the, the whole complexity of these charts but the United States is quite high up on this chart at 0.787%. But it's not near as, near as bad as, as Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, and Thailand, which are mostly countries that are in the uh, Southeast Asia area, you know. Anyway, listen, thank you guys for listening. Uh, my personal opinion is, is looking out maybe a month from now, or six weeks from now, we're probably going to see a, a second wave of people that are being transported to actually have the disease more than now. I think what happened was was when the Chinese government uh, quarantined that large area that they have quarantined right now that has 400 million people in that region, they've basically quarantined that region. What they've done is they've, they've cut off the, the viruses transportation out to other places they've cut that off now and so what's happened is the virus will have to spread out further now before we'll see a second wave of people that are being transported with the virus more so you know so we're probably having to look out about six weeks before we start to see that second wave and that's when we're going to have to be all the more vigilant to try to keep the virus under control in countries like the United States of America and here in Canada you know, that's where it's going to be the second the second wave, I think, is probably going to be about maybe six weeks from now. Uh, that's as the virus spreads out more. You know, I, I'm not expecting this virus to disappear, you know, uh, especially in China. Uh, it, it's just begun. Uh, you have to understand something. Very important. That. There's only like 30 some odd thousand people that have the virus in China right now. There's 1.4 billion people in China. So only one person in it, roughly, roughly every 50,000. So only one person in 50,000 in China have it right now. So the virus, because 
that China is showing you by isolating 400 million people, basically cordoning, cordoning them, them off, not letting them come out of their houses. China's got a huge problem with the spread of this virus. It's spreading fast through China. A lot faster than people could imagine, you know. And it's got a long way to go. It's got a lot of room to grow. In other words, the virus doesn't care. It looks at people like fuel. It's like a fire, and it looks at people as the fuel to move through, you know. And so picture if you had a, a furnace, you know, or, or whatever, or say a, say a giant pile of logs was starting to burn. It's just one little area on the side of the log pile that's starting to burn. But you got an enormous log pile there. That's Well, that's what this is like. It's only in one little group of people in China have it, which is only like 30,000 people. But there's 1.4 billion people in China. So it, in a dense population, too. So the Chinese government... They've said, okay, all of you have to stay at home and you're not allowed to come out and everything else. How long is that going to last? People need to eat, you know, before people start to gather together again and grocery shop or whatever. The next thing you know, it starts to transmit again through, through, through a larger population in China. And at a certain point, China can't, I mean, they can't hold the people home forever. I mean, that's, I mean, at a certain point. This thing's just waiting to pounce, this virus. It's waiting for China to make the first mistake, you know? And I think all they've really done in China right now is just slow down. They've slowed it down a lot because of what they're doing. But I don't think they've stopped it. I think that it's going to continue to progress, you know? Uh, I have to award their effort of, of taking, it's unprecedented to take 400 million people and basically tell them they all have to stay home. You know, I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And it's going to have a profound effect upon the Chinese economy. Closing all these ports, I think they closed like eight different ports have been closed in China. They're, they can't go to the factory to work. I think like 70% of the Chinese economy right now comes from that region that they've closed down. You know, 70% of the factory production. You know? They've closed it down. So China is going to go into negative growth territory in this next, uh, this next. I'm going to say, a depression that's coming. Listen, thank you guys for listening. I know I rambled on a little bit. You guys have a great night. This has been your virus update, and we'll catch you guys in the very next show. Bye-bye.